Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us this evening for this exploration of consciousness in the age of artificial intelligence. And look, in any discussion of consciousness, it is important to get one thing straight at the outset. We do not know what consciousness is. <laughs> and that's in light of the fact that each of us, I think, but I do not know for sure, each of us can attest to what the experience of consciousness is, what consciousness feels like. And some of us can further attest through meditative practice or chemically induced modifications, can attest to what altered states of consciousness are like. But we are still very much in the dark regarding how it is that configurations of material particles that themselves do not seem to have any kind of inner world. They somehow, in aggregate, generate inner worlds of phenomenological experience. Now look, some will consider this mystery and say that I have phrased it with undue bias. They'll say, it is not that matter makes mind, but rather that mind makes matter. Or in another variation, mind transcends matter. Or in another variation, matter, even at the level of fundamental ingredients, does contain the seeds of consciousness, containing something that some have called proto-consciousness. Now, these issues are surely deeply compelling in their own right, right? I mean, consciousness is utterly essential to life as we experience it. But in recent years, these issues have become yet more central because, as we all know, right, we are living through a transition in which artificial intelligences of various flavors, right, they are becoming ever more present, raising the question of the insights we might glean by thinking about consciousness in this era of artificial intelligence. And to discuss these issues, I am pleased to bring in two guests who have really spent decades immersed in these very questions, trying to gain insight into thinking about the process of thinking. So first, we have David Chalmers, who is a university professor of philosophy and neuroscience and co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness at New York University. His most recent book, Reality Plus Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy, was named one of 2022's best books of the year by the Washington Post. Thanks David, great to see you. Great to be here. And we also have Anil Seth, who is a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience and director of the Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Sussex. He is Editor-in-Chief of Neuroscience of Consciousness, and his book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, was a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller. Congratulations, and great to see That's you. That's fine. Great to see you. So, you know, before we get into some of the details, I'd like to just get a real quick sense of where each of you is coming from. I think I, I know the answer, but just, even if you want to give a yes or no, that, that would be good enough. Do you, David, think that an artificial system will ever be conscious? I think it's possible for an AI system to be conscious. I think it's possible for a machine to be conscious. The brain itself is a big machine. Somehow that machine produces consciousness. We don't know how, but it does it somehow. And I think if biology can do it, I don't see why silicon can't do it. I can't see. We don't understand how silicon could give us consciousness. We also understand how neurons could give us consciousness. So I don't see a difference in principle. So that's a yes. That's a I yes. take it. Absolutely. And Neil, how about you? I'm going to give the annoying it depends answer. It depends on what we mean by, by AI. So I think for the kinds of AI that we have at the moment, I think it's very, very unlikely. I think it can't be ruled out. Yeah. But I, I think that we overestimate the possibility because we conflate consciousness with intelligence. And we have still this pervasive idea that, that computation of some sort is the basis of consciousness. Yeah. And I think that is really a really shaky assumption. 
I agree with Dave that, that I think consciousness is, if you like, an achievement of a biological machine, but to call it a machine, to call the brain a machine, is, it's a very different kind of machine. And it may be the kind of machine that silicon stuff just cannot can, implement. Cannot emulate, yeah. All right, so let's just get into a little more detail. So famously, and I know that you've been asked this question so many times that you probably recoil at it, but in 1995, you coined the term, the hard problem of consciousness, which for many people, certainly I include myself in that, crystallized why this is such a conundrum. So can you just give us a short summary of what you mean by the hard problem? Sure, and I should say this was never an original observation. I think, you know, everybody knew in their bones that consciousness posed a hard problem. This label just kind of crystallizes the problem and makes it a bit harder to avoid. But, you know, you go to a conference on consciousness and you find people talk about many different things. Sometimes it's just used for the difference between being asleep and being awake. Um, sometimes it's used for the ability to control your behavior in certain considered ways. Sometimes it's used for the ability to report um, certain internal states. But I think where consciousness is concerned, those things are actually what I call the easy problems. Not because it's straightforward to explain them. It's probably about as hard as anything in ordinary sure. cognitive neuroscience, but we've got a paradigm for explaining those things. You come up with a mechanism that produces appropriate behavior, say behavior typical of a wakeful person, and you'll have explained the difference between being asleep and being awake. But when it comes, the hard problem of consciousness is subjective experience. I think you gave a great gloss on this in your introduction. It's, you know, it's the feeling of experience from a first person point of view, the feeling of seeing and hearing, the feeling of feeling your body and um, emotions, pain, the feeling of thinking, the feeling of acting, all the stuff that we experience subjectively. And what makes it hard is those paradigms that we have in science, and especially in neuroscience and cognitive science, for explaining things in terms of mechanisms that do a job and producing behavior, doesn't seem to work for subjective experience. There always seems to be a gap. Um, explain, yeah, sleep versus wake, explain report versus not. There's still the question, why is it subjectively experienced? Yeah. It seems to need a new method. That's why it's a hard problem. And there, there I think we're many, and, and I'm really thinking of my own journey in appreciating the depth of this problem. There was a time when I would hear things like that and say, mm, it's just a matter of figuring it out. It's just a matter of understanding how the brain works better, fuller, more completely. And once we have that, somehow this explanation for phenomenological experience will emerge. And then I encountered this little thought experiment, which I think had a big impact on, on you too, and maybe, Neil, I don't know if you as well, this, this thought experiment about Mary from Frank Jackson. And we have a little version of it that I'll quickly play and then maybe I can have you both comment on what you think it may be telling us about the nature of conscious experience. Imagine that in the far, far future, there's a brilliant neuroscientist named Mary who, for some reason, is confined to a room in which everything appears in black and white. There is no color of any sort whatsoever. Mary can study and access and examine the world outside, but it all comes to her only in black and white. Even so, Mary is able to reach a goal that has long eluded humankind. She totally and fully unravels every last detail about the structure, function, physiology, chemistry, biology, and physics of the brain. She knows absolutely everything there is to know about the behavior of the brain's every neuron, every molecule, every atom. She knows precisely what goes on inside our heads, the details of all neural processes that cascade when we see a beautiful red rose or when we marvel at a rich blue sky. One day, Mary is allowed to leave her room and the very first thing she sees is a plump 
red tomato. Now here's the question. From this experience of the color red, will Mary learn anything new? Will she shrug and just move on? Or will she be surprised or thrilled or moved or gain some new insight through this actual experience of color? And if she does, what does that tell us about the limits of a purely physical description of the brain and consciousness? So that's, that's the little story. So what should we take from And where do you come down on that story? I like the thought experiment. I mean, it's, this thought experiment has been used for many different purposes. But I think one thing it does wonderfully is it illustrates the gap, a certain kind of gap between our understanding of the objective world and our understanding of consciousness. Because you can set it up so that Mary seems to know all of the objective properties of the brain, how um, you know, your eyes respond to different wavelengths yeah. and how it gets fed to visual cortex, how it gets categorized, how it is we come up with labels like red, green, blue, and so on. She knows all that before she ever sees color. Um, so you'd think she knows everything about the world, but she knows everything about the objective world, but she doesn't know about the subjective experience of seeing red. If she sees it for the first time, it's like, oh, so that's what it's like to see red. Now, Jackson goes on to argue from here that this shows there's more in the world than physical processes. And th that's, a further, that's a further story that you know, involves a lot of controversial elements. But I think yeah. it's a wonderful illustration of this basic gap between our knowledge of the objective world yeah. and our knowledge of subjective experience. And so, Neil, how does this story affect your thinking? Well, I think I, I think I like it a bit less, and this is possibly because <laughs> I'm not, not a philosopher um, by training, but I'm always suspicious of these kinds of thought experiments, they're sort of conceivability arguments. They ask us to imagine things, yeah. which actually we can't really imagine. I mean, what would it be like to in know everything, absolutely everything, about anything? Yeah. I don't think we can ever really know what that would be like, and therefore what would be surprising and what wouldn't be surprising. And also, you, and Dave's right, there is a gap here. But for me, it's not a surprising gap. You know, knowing about the details of how something works doesn't necessarily give you the experience of being that thing. Like, if I know everything about flying, I don't become able to fly. Um, and so I imagine that if Mary did know everything there is to know, and she goes out of the door, and she might say, oh, it's exactly how I would expect it so to be. So she would shrug, potentially. She would probably shrug, but of course she would still learn something new because she would have an experience she hasn't had before. But that would be, you know, I think, just reflective of, the, of a gap about how we get the knowledge, not some sort of deep gap in reality that has to be crossed that shows that consciousness is, is beyond the, you know, the reach of science. I don't think it shows that. And so when you think about consciousness, I gather that you place significant weight on the biological mechanism by which we have one example, our own, and how it has emerged. Is that, do you think, utterly central to consciousness? I mean, and when you, when you say that, are you saying that it has to be the things that make us up, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, sulfur. I mean, if you change out the molecules, could it still work? Or is it really essential that we got here from some evolutionary trail that took us you know, from single-celled organisms to here? Is that the vital part of what a biological system provides? I think in practice, our evolutionary history is very, very important. It can't, I don't, that's true pretty much of every aspect. But I think if we could sort of magically be re reconstituted without having had an evolutionary history, that would, that would be fine too. I mean, there are so many things about um, how we are as animals, how other animals are as the animals they are, that depend on their biology. Metabolism depends on, on biology, it depends on chemistry. Digestion does, many things do. So I think as a sort of first approximation, it makes sense to me to think that consciousness is another, kind of, is another biological property. It doesn't mean that necessarily only biological systems can be conscious. But as you said, that's the only system we know of so far. Yeah. And we'll try and use metaphors. And we have this metaphor as the brain as a computer. But it's easy to confuse 
a metaphor with the thing itself. And, and when we do that, that's when I think we, we might get into trouble and think consciousness could be stripped away from the stuff that we're made of and implemented in, in some other thing. So are you, are you driven by the hard problem? Because I've also heard you coin an analogous type of problem called the real problem. Yeah, well, that was mainly to annoy Dave, <laughs> <laughs> just, just to wind him up a little bit. Um, but I think, I mean, the hard problem has been so definitional for the field. When I started in, in this area about now, 20 years ago or something, it was already you know, the way the field was organized. Thanks, thanks to Dave. And it's- Way to make me feel old, Emil. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is, it's really important because it does highlight how difficult the problem is. But I also think that the fact that it seems difficult now does not mean that it will always have this aura of, of there being something beyond the reach of explanation in terms of mechanisms. To give a very imperfect analogy, we've been here before. So about 150 years ago, not so long ago, people thought life couldn't be explained in terms of stuff, in terms of physics and chemistry. There had to be something else. There seemed to be a, an analogous hard problem of life. Right. But of course, that didn't turn out to be right. There is, we still don't understand every last detail of life, but there's no longer a sense of conceptual mystery that we need an, es an en vital, a spark of life, something beyond the laws of, of nature as they are. So I, I like to think that as we build bridges between explanations in terms of mechanisms sure. and what experience is like, then maybe the hard problem won't be solved, but it might be dissolved. You know, I tend to agree with you. In fact, I often make the same analogy between the fact that there was a hard problem of life and a hard problem of kind of we solved the former we think. But are, is that too quick? Have we solved the hard problem of life? Do we, are we convinced that you know, we understand the mechanism is just a matter of putting things together in the right way. Well, I don't think it's a great analogy, um, to be honest. Because yeah. I mean, in the case of life, all of the things that we really wanted to explain were kind of these objective processes of reproduction, of adaptation, of metabolism, yeah. growth, and, uh, and so on. And I think it was, there was a certain point where we didn't see how how it is that a physical mechanism could do those functional things. So some people thought we need maybe a vital spirit. But right. the problem was always the problem of explaining these objective behaviors that living systems show. And eventually we found how DNA and so on could extend into a, uh, a story about how that could happen. Whereas, but in the case of consciousness, you know, we've got analogs to all those things, but those are all the easy problems. Yes. If someone said, look, we can't even explain how it is that people are walking and talking and remembering and so on, then, uh, then that would be analogous to the vitalist about life. But there's this further datum in the case of consciousness, which is first person subjective experience, which doesn't really have an analog in the case yeah. of life, except for the case of consciousness itself. Right. Some people have argued, well, actually we can't explain everything about life because consciousness is itself a crucial aspect of life that we're not explaining. But right. then we're just back to the same yeah, of hard course. problem. And so when it comes to the real problem, which I guess you maybe would sort of characterize as the, the easy problem, I mean, how, how far along are we? I mean, in terms of even just having models of consciousness that can give us insight into the, the physical processes that allow this kind of experience to emerge. Some days, you know, when I wake up, I think, ah, we're, we're nowhere. It still seems as mysterious as ever. But then other days with a bit more of a sober uh, look at things, progress has been made. And I think that's strategically, you know, that's one of the advantages, I think, of this easy problem, real problem approach. I do think they're very similar. I think I call the real problem mainly because to emphasize that we can still talk about the nature of experience rather than just what people do or, or yeah. say. We can try and explain why vision is the way it is, different from emotion, different from experiences of free will. And much more is now, I think, understood about the me about why these experiences are the way they are and why they are, are different from each other. And we are now at a stage in the neuroscience of consciousness with the help of other disciplines as well, that we have a bunch of theories that, that target different aspects of consciousness that are beginning to be compared and contrasted. And whether we will come up with a, a fully satisfactory solution to consciousness as a whole, I think that, I, I don't know, we don't, 
it's, it's too early to say. But I don't think we can exclude that as a possibility. So the analogy, I think, operates at a different level. It's not that life as a problem is the same as consciousness as a problem. It's just that something that seemed really mysterious with the tools and concepts available at one point was no, no longer so mysterious with a different set of tools and yeah. concepts. And we should all be show some humility in the face of this yeah. problem. I mean, it's very early days. No one's philosophical or scientific pronouncements now are going to reflect how things are at the, uh, at the end of the day. So I think you know, we should all be open to all kinds of amazing new insights, which will make what we're now saying be primitive. But I, I actually like what Anil calls the, uh, the real problem. I'm not wild about the name. I think you know, <laughs> hey, there, are, there are a lot of problems here. But I think it is important that we can actually make progress in the science of consciousness without solving yes. the hard problem. Yes. If we had to wait for a solution to the hard problem, we might be waiting a long time for the science. And one yeah. thing we've really seen over the last, say, three decades or so since the science of consciousness really, uh, really got going is people studying things like you know, the neural correlates of consciousness, those processes in the brain that correlate most directly with consciousness. You can study that scientifically without having an answer to the, uh, to the hard problem. So I, I call this the mapping problem. Yeah. I think of it as one of the easier problems, but I totally agree with Anil that this is a, uh, this is a really important problem for the science. And it could well be that as we get better and better mappings, correlations from physical processes to consciousness, somewhere along the way we'll be struck by something, you know, some say mathematical property of the processes and consciousness that leads us to propose, ah, that's Here is a principle that might cross the gap. Yeah. And, and so you mentioned the number of theories that people have put forward, and they are replete, right? We have you know, integrated information theory, global workspace, intentious schema theory. I mean, there are many. Do you have a, a favorite or one that guides your own thinking well, I prefer about mine, yeah, yeah. What's that? I prefer my theory. I mean, Let's hear it. So it's, I mean, I th the others, I think they all have good points. One of the problems is that all theories of slightly different things which does make them difficult to compare. So the, the, the theory that I tend to favor, I mean, it's, it's a collection of ideas, really. It's just, I put it in a particular way. It's the idea of the brain as a prediction machine. So arguably, it's not really a theory of consciousness at all, because it does not say, like, these are the sufficient conditions, and then, boom, consciousness happens. The other theories tend to say something like this. Yes. The idea of the brain as a prediction machine goes way back, and it's really this idea that everything the brain does, pretty much, involves it making predictions about the causes of sensory signals, and then using sensory signals to calibrate, to update these predictions. And when it comes to consciousness, the idea is that everything that we're conscious of, whether it's an experience of the world, whether it's an experience of the self, whether it's an experience of free will or volition, is a kind of perception. It's the brain trying to make sense of the situation in some way. And in that framing, every kind of conscious experience can be understood, can be thought of as, a, as underpinned by this process of the brain making predictions and updating predictions, but in different ways, in, in different contexts. The, the, the sort of slogan for this is that perceptual experience is a kind of controlled hallucination. That we don't read the world out objectively, we, create we kind of actively it. construct right. it. Right. But then the way I take it is that doesn't just apply to the world around us. It applies to the experience of being a self within that world. It applies to emotion. It applies to free will. And ultimately, it's all about physiological regulation of the body. The reason brains do this prediction is because prediction allows control. And brains evolved, I think, fundamentally to control, regulate, keep the body alive. And that kind of leads, if you pull on this thread long enough, you do get to this intimate connection between how consciousness seems to us, and the fact that we are living, breathing, flesh and blood, right. energy consuming creatures. But in the end of the day, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're not imagining that there's anything beyond the physical when it comes to consciousness, and you're not imagining that we need to modify our understanding of the fundamental ingredients that at root make up the physical. It's just a matter of putting it together and getting a deeper understanding of the processes and somehow in there an explanation for consciousness will emerge. Yeah, I think it really should be a last resort to invoke new fundamental principles of the universe, right? I, I think matter is 
very complicated. It's not just you know, neurons that go, that turn on and off. And yeah. It's not just atoms bouncing around in the void. The resources of this idea of materialism, that consciousness is a property of matter suitably arranged, well, that, there's a lot that can be done with that. It's, 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 it seems short-sighted, I think, to say that, well, clearly we could never explain consciousness in terms of things happening in, in matter, because matter is really, really rich and interesting. So, David, when you th think about, I mean, you didn't just coin the hard problem. You've been trying to solve the hard problem, you know, for, for, for decades. Can you imagine, even if you don't know the solution, the flavors of how the solutions might ultimately look? Sure, and I think there's a few different candidates, but the basic idea which I tend to focus on is finding some kind of mappings between physical processes and consciousness, and ultimately trying to boil that down to something really simple and fundamental. I mean, I like the predictive processing story that uh, Anil was telling about the brain as a prediction machine, but I think in a way that explains too much. It applies just as well to unconscious processes as to conscious yeah. processes. It needs to be combined with some other completely different bit of machinery to explain why some states of the brain are distinctively conscious and others, um, others are not. And I'm, I like a number of the existing theories, like the global workspace theory, um, as giving you the beginnings of a physical basis for consciousness. But ultimately, what I would like is something like a, you know, in physics, people say sometimes you're looking for laws so simple, you can write them on the front of a t-shirt, right, to be like the fundamental laws of physics. Well, if it turns out that we can't explain consciousness fully in terms of physical processing, then that doesn't mean it's beyond science, but it may mean we need something like another fundamental law or a fundamental principle to connect physical processes to consciousness. And then the question is, will it connect to something like biology? I'm skeptical, you know, I think biology is somehow a little bit too, too high level in a way. I suspect it's gonna to connect to something like, that. if you look at the correlations between consciousness and the brain, it's really the informational properties yeah. of the brain that matter and not ultimately the biological properties. If you ask me what I'm really looking for, um, some kind of beautiful mathematical equation that connects information and computation and the brain to consciousness. There is this integrated information theory that does some of that. I'm actually very skeptical about that yeah. for some other reasons, but it's at least trying to do the right kind of thing and coming up with a fundamental principle. So do you allow for you know, what is normally called a dualist perspective, that there's consciousness and there's the physical, and what we are experiencing is some kind of interaction blending between them, but it would simply be wrong to imagine that consciousness could be solely explained by understanding the physical. Is that a solution that you could imagine? I'm open to that kind of view. And in philosophy, we sometimes talk about property dualism because people, when you say dualism, people, a lot of the time people think about a soul, some non-physical entity that got attached to our body and is hanging out with our brain and interaction and then continues living after the body dies. That's not the kind of thing I have in mind. But the idea is rather there could be fundamental properties of the universe beyond space and time and mass and charge or whatever your the latest you know, fundamental physical theory says. If it turns out that existing properties don't explain consciousness, then we should be open to the idea that, hey, consciousness is itself a fundamental, and importantly, that there might be fundamental laws, I call them psychophysical laws, yeah. connecting physical processes and consciousness. And that needn't be unscientific or spooky. It's just one way things could go. Another way things could go is it could turn out there's some element of consciousness at the very basis of matter. It's the view that you mentioned, the view people call panpsychism. And that's extremely speculative, but it's a view I take seriously. If someone come up with a scientific form of panpsychism, then I think we should take that seriously. And so the particles themselves would have potentially some kind of seed of inner experience and when you put enough of them together in the right way, the aggregate yields the conscious experience. Yeah, and the happen. real problem for this view is, you know, not so, some people think, oh, come on, this is loopy or crazy. But for me, the biggest problem for this view is precisely that aggregation. Yeah. How do you get, take a bunch of conscious particles and put them together and get the kind of unified conscious experience that I'm having 
right now, and that's called the combination problem, and nobody has a good solution to it. But if somebody solves that problem, then that's instantly a contender yeah. for a theory of consciousness. Well, I mean, maybe, but I think there are other problems with it as well. I think all the versions of this idea of panpsychism that, that I've encountered all face the problem that not only is it not testable in itself, but it doesn't lead to testable predictions. Um, and I think that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it's very hard as a scientist to know what to do with a view like that. I would that. say panpsychism is a philosophical thesis. Yeah. It's not itself a testable theory, but a specific panpsychist theory that came up with, with say, some mathematical principles that say under these conditions, you know, you get this kind of this kind of physical system, this kind of consciousness. That specific panpsychist theories could be tested. Then yes, but I haven't seen any any like yeah, that. That's yeah. right. Very early days. <laughs> we don't have any good theories of consciousness. And that's but then num can number you, one thing to keep Can you mind. imagine then that one day we may all converge on an answer that at least in particle physics we seem to be satisfied with maybe we shouldn't. When if you ask me, what do you mean by the mass of a particle? I'd actually tell you functionally what the mass does, how it responds to gravity, how it responds to forces. If you said to me, what do you mean by the electric charge of a particle? I'd kind of play the same game. I'd say, well, in an electric field, it will do this or that based upon the charge it has. But I would be unable to tell you what mass is and what charge is. There are primitive fundamentals that exist in the universe, and I'm willing to say, okay, they exist by fiat, I know they're there and go forward. Could it be that one day we simply say, consciousness, it's just this fundamental quality of reality, and it doesn't have a deeper explanation, and you take it as a given and you go forward? This is great because uh, yeah, the Norwegian philosopher Hedda Hassel Merck has called this the hard problem of matter. Like we, yeah. You say we don't know what right. consciousness is. You say we actually don't know what yeah. mass is. You know, yeah. physics tells us what mass does and the equations yeah. um, it's involved in. But what actually is mass? What is the intrinsic nature um, of mass or of charge or maybe even of space and time? And yeah, philosophers and scientists argue about this. Is the universe just mathematical? Is it structural? I mean, a lot of people, I think, want to say there is no intrinsic nature of mass, that's just a chimera you're looking for. You know, what mass does, that's all there is. And so somebody could take that view for consciousness too. All there is to consciousness is what it does. Yeah. The trouble is, in the case of consciousness, what it does, that's just the easy problems. And right. it leaves out the central datum of subjective experience. If somebody finds a way to take subjective experience, seems intrinsic, and just turn that into a, uh, a problem about what consciousness does, then that might, be a, uh, that might be an avenue to a solution. But so far, yep. anytime anyone does that, which ha and happens a lot, it just looks like a bait and switch. You've moved from talking about consciousness to talking about behavior exactly. or something so else. So Neil, can I just ask you one question along those lines? Because I do want to get to this issue of, of AI systems. And, and so you know, we're now in a realm where there are computational systems that are mimicking certain aspects of behavior. They're able to respond to certain prompts in a way that ordinarily we would have thought only an intelligent human being could do. And of course the question comes to f the fore of, are these systems conscious? It's pretty clear they're, they're not yet, but could they be conscious? And of course it's a deep question, important one, but how could we ever possibly know? I mean, this is another very hard problem about how we test for consciousness yeah. in things that are not ours. I mean, we face this even with other human beings. I mean, it's often said that I only know for sure that I'm conscious. It's, a, it's just a, an inference that, yeah. that you are, that you are, and that, that any of you are. But it's a reasonably I mean, I am, safe just inference. So you're wondering, but you, but would, yeah, say yeah, you yeah, would say yeah, that. You would say that. It's a pretty safe inference, though. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> not so sure. Uh, but because we have so much else in common, right? We, we can basically yeah. say, it would be very strange if it was only me that was conscious, given everything else that, that we have in common. The further we get away from the benchmark of an intact human being, the harder it gets. Even with uh, human patients suffering brain injuries, course, it's already yeah. very difficult to know whether they are conscious, because whether they are or not can be dissociated from their behavior, their ability to tell you that they're right. conscious. And then the further we get, we have huge debates about non-human animals. There was a recent New York declaration about animal consciousness, trying to you know, just put the idea in people's minds that 
many uh, non-human animals might be conscious. Vegan, just saying, but go ahead. When it comes to computers and AI, it's so much harder. And I yeah. think here, we're misled by our psychological biases. Now, we as humans, we have got a pretty terrible track record of withdrawing, of, of withholding moral consideration from things that are not us. Yeah. And part of the reason we do this is because they don't seem sufficiently similar to us in ways that we think matter. And the ways that we think matter tend to be things that we think make us special, like language, intelligence. Of course, it's questionable how intelligent we are as a species, but yeah. we tend to elevate ourselves and think, okay, no, no language, no consciousness. Descartes did something like this many, many centuries ago. So we might make false negatives a lot. With AI, I think we're in almost exactly the opposite situation. We have these language models that exercise our biases. They speak to us. Yeah. They seem to be intelligent in some way that's still easy to catch out, but something interesting is going on there. So because they're similar to us in the ways that we elevate and that we, we tend to um, prioritize, we project qualities into them that they probably don't have. Like, thinking, understanding, and of course, yeah. consciousness. Whereas they're very different to us in other ways. And it's those other ways in which they're very different that might actually matter for consciousness. And if we, if we were seeking to build a conscious, just call it AI just as a blanket term for something computational that we build, should we base it on trying to mimic the architecture of the brain or again, is that just such a limited way of thinking about how the process of thinking might be generated? Well, this First, is the one. Sorry. This is the, this is the one case we know about. Yes. So I mean, it's true when it comes to AI. You know, AI systems are a long way from uh, from human brains. Any non-human system is some distance from the one case we know for sure about. So there is something to be said for looking at human-like. AI, yeah. simply because it's going to be as similar to us as possible, but in a different substrate. So one idea that I like is the idea of you know gradually replacing yeah. parts of your, your brain, say replaced biological neurons. Can you by... take us through this? Because I think it's a curious way of thinking about it. Ah, here things. we go. Yeah. We've got brain, uh, yeah, brain uploading. So this is a, uh, a drawing of the, uh, of the philosopher Susan Schneider, who's written about this by an illustrator from my book, Reality Plus, called Tim Peacock. And, yeah, just say we gradually replace neurons in our brains by silicon chips, which are as similar as possible. And first you replace 1% of the brain, 10% of the brain. I guess right here, we're seeing uh, about 50% of the brain uh, replaced. And she's still saying, I'm still here. It's like, yeah, the silicon chips are doing the job just as well. Then we go all but the way. But she's sounding more and more like Siri, right, <laughs> as you go along. <laughs> we get all the way to 100%, and she says, yeah, I'm still here. We, you could do yeah. that. I could do that. And then at that very moment, maybe we would then have the first person datum that we are conscious, although we are made of silicon, and that would be a kind of datum. So would that experiment, that thought experiment, if it were successful in the real world, would that convince you? But I don't think it could be successful in the real world. I think it's another example of these, these nice thought experiments that we can help ourselves to. But actually, if you unpack what it's asking, it's, it's very, very difficult to imagine anything like this could happen. I think, I think that, that matters because it matters for the conclusions that we, we draw. We have this very nice idea that you gradually replace every neuron, every connection with a wire and a little silicon chip. But brains aren't really the kinds of things where you can do that. They're, everything that the brain does is incredibly entrenched, intertwined. There are chemicals swishing Isn't about. that just complexity? Doesn't that just make it difficult? It, it does make it difficult, but it makes it difficult in a way that I think undermines the utility of I see. thinking about these simple thought experiments. It's just not something that you could do. I mean, very. Basically, I think the brain is, is the kind of system where you can't cleanly separate what it does from what it is. You know, sometimes a neuron fires. It's not to communicate with other neurons. It's to get rid of metabolic waste products. So if you're going to get a model neuron that, that does that, you have to then not only replace all the neurons and connections, but all the stuff, all the metabolism that's going on underneath as well. And before you know it, you know, it's no longer possible to build it out of silicon, just as it's not possible to like, build a replica of the Brooklyn Bridge out of string cheese. You just, you just can't do it. It doesn't work like that. And so you made reference to human 
exceptionalism is perhaps misleading us or perhaps giving us guidance, right? It really depends on the problem and how you apply the idea. But can you imagine, maybe I should say this to David first, but I'll, you know, because you've already said you don't even think it's possible, but can you imagine that human consciousness is just one example of this huge spectrum of conscious-like experiences that can be instantiated in other systems that could be artificial or they could be organic, and that what we consider sort of this, this you know, wondrous quality of being a human being is actually just a pedestrian example of something that can take on so many other forms. I think that's, that's very likely right. I mean, the history of, of science and philosophy over the centuries has repeatedly shown us we're not at the center of things, and we're not the only, the, the, at the top of every mountain. We're not at the center of the universe. We're not separate from all other animals you know, created by God. And, and human consciousness is one way of, of being conscious. And it's one little region in a vast space of possible ways of being conscious. Many non-human animals will be conscious in different ways. And I do think it's consciousness is very likely something that's a material phenomenon. So it's very plausible to me that it could be implemented in something else, but maybe not in computers. Another example where I worry about a lot more than GPT-5, suddenly feel it, really feeling things, yeah. are emerging neurotechnologies, things like brain organoids. These are collections of human brain cells grown from stem cells in dishes. And they don't exercise any of our biases because they don't do anything. You know, they just kind of sit there in a dish. And, but they're made out of the same stuff and they self-organize and they display electrical activity. So immediately a whole area of uncertainty goes away. You know, frankly, we don't know whether it matters what we're made out of. I mean, we just don't know whether yeah. it matters or not. And so if you put that uncertainty out, for me, it's much more plausible that in 10 years, we have grown conscious systems in the lab than they've come out of the next generation of open AI's chatbots. I see. And so, David, final question, whether we grow new conscious systems in the lab in some glorified Petri dish, or we're able to create them at open AI, micro, whatever, wherever it happens, you know, should we be thinking about the, the ethical, moral side of this? I mean, if there's this conscious being that maybe can't even communicate its conscious state, do we, do we worry about that? I think absolutely. I mean, consciousness, many people think, including me, consciousness is kind of the gateway to the circle of morality, the circle of beings that we care about. The moment you acknowledge that animal, I mean, there's a debate about whether fish let's say you're conscious, but the moment you acknowledge that a fish is conscious and can feel pain and suffer, then suddenly a fish is a being that we should at least take into consideration in our moral calculus. If you don't take conscious beings into consideration, there's the danger of moral catastrophe. So I think this very much applies to AI and even to the emerging systems like the, uh, the large language models of the GPT family. We don't know for sure whether they're conscious. There's various reasons for thinking there's potential obstacles to consciousness they haven't overcome yet. But I think it's entirely possible that in the next 10 years or so, we will develop language models that overcome those obstacles and show every sign of being conscious. We've already got language models which are very close to passing the traditional Turing test, yeah. being indistinguishable from human beings in conversation. Some personas generated by GPT-4 of past five minute Turing test. In the past, we would have said that's evidence of consciousness. Yeah. Now, maybe it's not. Maybe for various reasons, we want to resist that. All I want to say, that question though is all important because if we just, if it, an AI system is conscious like a human and we continue to treat it simply like a tool so that we don't even have to take it, take it into account in, uh, in what we do, we are in danger of, yeah. of moral catastrophe. Well, I'll simply say that all my prompts to chat are incredibly respectful. So uh, <laughs> anyway, this is a great Thanks, conversation. Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cheers.